live in just a second. All right, it says we're live. Hi, mom. Let's see if anyone actually comes on and joins us. Let me double check at all platforms. My mom will probably it's tune in. Showing up. Your mom better tune in. I gave you your phone number, so watch out. Uh oh, I really should invite my parents to join these things. That'd be kind of fun. Do you well, think they'd we, be into it? Uh, they'd do it just to support and just kind of have fun. Like I tagged my dad in a birthday post. Uh, it was his birthday last week, and he's like, "Man, there was like 58 people that liked it. I've never felt like so so much like a big a big deal." And I was like, "Yeah, it's over 100." Dad, come on, come on. <laughs> Well, what's up, everybody? We are pseudo live. Is anybody joining in? If you're here, we should be live on the YouTube and the Facebook. And uh, maybe we should go live on, on Trump social network if that ever comes up. Apparently, that's that's big in the news. We're going to talk hot stock tips and maybe some crypto. Not really. We're here to talk books. Uh, if you are here, comment, say hello. Um, I believe on Facebook, we're using StreamYard. If you're on YouTube, we'll see your name. We can shout you out. Let us know your name, where you're from. I think if you're on Facebook, you have to log in one time. Is that correct, Matthew? Yeah, yeah. there's a link on the post or the post that was posted earlier today, one of the two, where you can click that and give them permission to show your name. Otherwise, it just says Facebook user to us, so we don't know who sent that in. Perfect. So, yes, do that. Otherwise... State your name when you're commenting. Otherwise, we'll just say Facebook user or user. So hopefully we get some people jumping in here. It's been a while since we've gone live. Uh, we have a special guest here. Many of you may know him. Avery, say hello. What's up, guys? What's going on? Bill Martlink with the first comment. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Is there or any way I can share this link in my uh, Facebook group? Matthew, can Avery share the link? Do we have to oh, share slash it? Facebook in your group? It's that I know that's not the actual link. Share the link to the live. Yeah, in your group, so it just says forward slash. Let me Facebook. grab the YouTube one. That'll be easier. That way, people that aren't part okay. of the group can still see it. Give me one you second. You know all the all the smart people that are not on Facebook. Boom! I found it on YouTube. I got it. You got it. Okay. Yep. Cool. Well, we're gonna do this. Um, I guess a couple orders of business as you share that. Let us know when that's done. You guys can go ahead. I'm going to share it in both groups. Fancy, fancy. I was going to say this. Uh, we were trying to talk earlier. I was trying to strong arm Avery. He's always asked us to sponsor his stuff. And uh, I, I think we were, we were trying to negotiate. So, guys, we're trying to get Avery to sponsor this live. You know um, what you should have done? What do you Some want people to just... They'll make YouTube videos and they'll say sponsored by restrictedinventory.com and they'll send it to me afterwards. That's what the college <laughs> picker did. And now I'm forced to sponsor him. So. <laughs> you don't have to. You could say great. I mean, you could give him a penny. So, it's guys, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> what do you think Romer should? Uh, oh, there's some comments. I wasn't seeing it earlier. I, I was looking at private chat. There we go. All right. So, Bill says first, Hayden's in the house, Sky Pilot, lots of names, the used book guy. Nice. Uh, good evening from the UK. All right. We're in multiple countries. Um, so yeah, Avery's going to sponsor this episode. The question is, what should he have to pay to sponsor it? I think we negotiated a beer or two, but uh, for anybody else, feel free to comment what Avery should have to sponsor us. We've been a longtime promoter of, of his uh, material and vice versa, but it's time to put some dollars on this relationship. <laughs> we've, been, we've been playing the long game. Uh, I guess to address the uh, 800 pound gorilla in the room, the uh, the mustache is real. It's uh, it's a cross between a social experiment, midlife crisis, and really, I'm just trying to go as Ted Lasso for Halloween. So bear with you me. Consider yourself midlife already. Uh, you know what? My family really only makes it to about 70, and I'm getting about halfway there. So gotcha. yeah, fair enough. Um, and if I get extra, then that's just borrowed time. So um, yeah. I like to say quarter life crisis, but I feel like that was 25 and I'm now north of that. So uh, it really was a social experiment just to see what would happen. And really nobody in my small town has said a whole lot about it, which either means it looks amazing or terrible. And I'm not sure which. So we'll uh, we'll see how it shakes out. So Romer's in the house. Let him know what, uh, what he should be sponsoring um, in terms of this. Uh, I am cheap. Pizza and beer is great. I will take that next time we meet up. Um, and speaking of meetups, we Avery actually hosted his first meeting. The whole thing went full circle. So the very first time we did a turn the page event would have been 2017, maybe. I think it was I think 2018. It, maybe early 2018. 
and flips, Avery sh- flips, flips for miles would know flips for miles knows my whole life. And every event <laughs> he's got your, he's got your timeline figured out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Avery came to our very first conference that we put on with Acceler list with Travis over there and uh, he showed up late. He got a seat right next to me, which was cool. And, you know, we headed off and we've been friends and, you know, we've done a little business and a lot of drinking together. Um, mostly business. There's not a ton of drinking. I feel like every other time we meet, you're not drinking anyway. So yeah. is what it is. This last time I, I drank, uh, I drank too much. Perfect. In uh, Tucson. Then, yeah. then we went on the jog afterwards. That well, was- and we did, we were chasing down scorpions in the house, unfortunately. So that was, that was interesting. I might've been hallucinating the scorpions, but I'm pretty sure they were real. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were real. Yeah, guys, don't go to Arizona. There's, there's black. I think I left my shoes there. They're probably a household to scorpions now. There's uh, probably, there's probably scorpions. they're probably in the closet. I think I black widows. I think you left a pair of shorts and a shirt there too. Yeah. So the local Goodwill is probably loving loving the Romer merchandise. <laughs> um, where were we going? Oh yeah. So it came full circle. So Avery came to our first event, and then uh, what? July, August. When did you do the Miami event? Uh, the Miami event was when was it? Uh, August. August. 8th. Right? It all, it all kind of flows together. So Matthew came in, um, our new assistant slash associate business partner, whatever. John was in the house as well. So that was a fun event. So Avery actually rented out a pretty dope hotel. It was really cool. And we had an awesome view of the ocean and the beach out there. And they fed us really well. It was a great event. So that was really fun to see. Uh, junk man, nice stash. Thank you. Don't encourage it. It might stay for a while. Uh, so that was awesome to just see that come full circle and to see you, Avery, kind of take charge and spearhead that event. So kudos to you. I think that'll be the first of many. We've yeah. we've thrown out trying to do a couple other events, um, maybe as we get closer to the end of the year. Did you want to do Florida still or were, were we looking into like New Mexico potentially? Uh, oh, New Mexico to do the event. <laughs> or I wasn't that, that's just New a Mexico small event, event, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Florida, I think is great. I think Florida is safe in terms of shutdowns and stuff but okay. uh i'm down for whatever orlando would be cool so comment vegas a location cool yeah vegas is always a popular location if you guys want yeah. to do a meetup uh we're getting really close to the end of the year it'd have to be a last last minute meetup but if you guys want we can find a little venue fly in a few speakers do some uh do some delicious food uh coffee all kinds of good stuff so if you want that let us know where you'd like to meet up we're thinking florida i think it's some other stuff so that'd be that'd be anna cool. maria say miami Miami. We just did Miami. We could do it again. Yeah. I, I feel like we shouldn't do Miami for the booksellers meetup because I'm going to do Miami 2022. Yeah. Well, Bill, Bill Martlink, since uh, Avery is only sponsoring with a beer, Bill's pretty uh, friendly. He might be able to sponsor at least the first round for everybody. He's done that before. He's a generous dude. Bill, where should we meet up if you're still watching? Uh, he said he'd up- be down. I, t- I talked to him about a, uh, two weeks ago. He said he all would right. be down for. for yeah, he's yeah. all he's always down to uh, to kind of go meet and network and and have some fun. Bill just says dollar signs. <laughs> would we ever go to Canada? Uh, we would. It's starting to get back open. Um, where are you at? Are you Toronto or are you are you west? Canada is definitely an option. Bill says somewhere warm, so that's going to put the Knicks, the Knicks on Canada. But uh, Nashville, that's always a good spot to go. Would I would be down for Nashville. That'd Nashville be, cool. be fun, and that's not going to be too cold. I've never been to Nashville, so I'd go there. Ah, uh, they said Ottawa. Yeah. All right. Miami. You've never been warm. to Nashville, Matthew. Never been to. Wow. Nashville. Are you serious? You've never been to the six one five? I've never been there. Oh man, let's let's tear it up. We should All right, guys. Do Nashville. We we do have one giveaway, and then we're going to get into some content as well. So have some questions. This is mostly just we've not gone live in a while, and it's it's past due. I do have a giveaway. This was, uh, we're going to talk about challenges in business. And of course, the big one right now is restock limits. But how many of you guys remember the uh, textbook gate and everybody buying uh, uh, textbooks and the the test orders and the law firms and kind of the shutdowns? So we made these t shirts just as kind of a, you know, don't, if you guys remember, Rockville, Maryland was where the law firm was stationed. They've since gotten smarter and and spread out and, Actually, a lot of the books are gated on Amazon now, which makes it easier to just kind of stay away from counterfeits. But they're out there. You guys can watch some of the old content. I do have two of these to give away. So if uh, I have one large and one small, Matthew, how should we give these away? I don't know. We should do something tied. You're not going to give away mine, are you? You just I don't know. I have three. (laughs) One has your name on it. I've got one large (laughs) and one small left. These are the very comfiest shirts ever. Um, I, you know, they're really, really the softest t-shirts ever, ever known to man. 
or women. I will rock that shirt every day. I wear There's it a no, lot and no nobody really me. gets it, which is kind of the point. I actually had a call with the law firm. So if you guys are watching, hello. Um, I almost wore the shirt for that call. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but now the cat's out of the bag. So we'll we'll try and figure out how to uh, how to give those away. That was just kind of fun. Um, that's not behind you. There still is counterfeits out there. You still need to be careful if you're selling textbooks. And that's, of course, a nice lead into restrictedinventory.com. So for those that aren't aware, are we taking a selfie on camera? Yeah, I'm promoting on Instagram nice. now. So for those that aren't aware, Avery, you want to give just a, a two minute rundown of what restrictedinventory.com is? Yeah. So a few years ago, uh, textbook restrictions became a thing. I was on the East Coast going down with my buddy, Andrew, who I met at the Turn the Page event. We were just going from Airbnb to Airbnb and we sourced about, I think it was like $10,000 uh, net profit that we ended up splitting. And he kept passing up these $100 textbooks. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, why are you passing up these $100 textbooks? And he's like, you can't sell these. You're not allowed to sell these. I was like, dude, I sell them all the time. That's how I started my business in college. I would sell textbooks. And that's when I discovered that there was textbook restrictions. And that was really like the best time for me to start this business. At the time, I didn't call it restrictedinventory.com. I would just sell textbooks for other Amazon sellers. So whether that's, you know, Andrew, um, other buddies of mine, but the word started spreading in the Facebook groups, really the book flipper community. That's where everybody kept saying, Avery will sell them, Avery will sell them. And then I was having a beer with Caleb in Chicago. And he said, you know, you should buy restrictedinventory.com. And we Googled it and the domain was available. And I purchased You're it welcome. for 12 bucks right there. And then that's, that's when it, it took off. And then, uh, I think, I think I sold somewhere between 60 and $80,000 of really the community's textbooks that August. And I was like, wow, I should really put a lot more effort into this. And since then, you know, we, we've gotten our tracking down. We use Caleb Ross tracking spreadsheet. We've built a whole software really around his tracking spreadsheet, give you guys numbers on, on what textbooks we're selling, how much they're selling for. We split profit 50, 50, we cover prep. We cover basically all inventory, um, not cost, but inventory management. We reprice your books. We're greedy. We want to make as much money as possible. So we try and sell your books for as much money as possible. Um, and yeah, we really, it's, a, it's an inventory management service. All we ask is that you cover shipping to us and you can go to restrictedinventory.com and we have a FedEx integration. We get 60% discounts with FedEx right now. You can get that label printed out and send us inventory. Again, we prep at no cost. We send it, we sell everything Amazon FBA. So we sell it for as much as possible. Yes, you could sell these items on eBay. You could sell them to Book Scouter, but we're never going to do what the Book Scouter vendors do, where they say your textbook is not worth as much as it actually is. The Book Scouter vendors will pay pennies in the dollar for the book. And even if they say they're going to pay a lot for it, sometimes they say, never mind, you know, we can't pay this much because it's in bad condition. We'll never do that to you. We'll sell it Amazon FBA and get that premium price for the book. So that's really it. Cool. So that whole spiel was about three minutes. So at a hundred bucks a <laughs> so, minute, uh, yeah. we'll send an invoice for 300 now, now it's officially sponsored. <laughs> Before go. you just mentioned my name and my personal brand, but now, now the there it is. There so it is. Now I got so it's what, pretty cool idea. You send me money for the Scout IQ shirt that I wore on my Instagram story. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you money. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll have our lawyers talk to your lawyers. Um, yeah, it was a, a pretty good idea, a way to kind of hedge your bets. Um, so for those of you that are restricted, which is pretty much any newer seller and a lot of other, older sellers were not, you know, kind of scapegoated in or, or backdoored into that solution. That's a great option. Um, I won't even, does your com competition still do the, the service at all? No, there, there's one guy, but he does, he charges for prep and uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think he's doing a, a phenomenal job. I don't know, but there, there was three that popped up and they're all out now. Perfect. So Avery's been around for a bit. Got, got a question there for you. Can restricted inventory be sent directly from Amazon back to you? Yeah. Just make sure if you send it to us that you go to the website. We always have the most updated address to send it to. So make sure to go check the website and make sure to put your name on the inventory when you send it to us. So when you create the removal order, it's make sure to like put as the destination, put your name. And so we have all those instructions on the website how to do that. But we want to make sure that we uh, know your inventory came from you. Perfect. And it's uh, info at restrictedinventory.com if you have any extra questions. Yeah, that's the email. Cool. So the I guess the the 
moral of the story, we really haven't been alive in a bit. We've kind of been settling in, uh, traveling a bit, and just trying to deal with all the new restock limits. We kind of thought, you know, when those came out, we did a video maybe, gosh, I think restock limits have been in place now for about six months. So uh, things have things have changed. I think the hunch, so we'll, we'll kind of go around the horn here and just say what everybody thinks. One of the questions Michael Kreider asked was, uh, what is, you know, what's the future of restock limits? And I've got my own theories. Uh, I had a theory when they first came out and I'm not often right. In fact, I'm usually wrong when it comes to Amazon. But for those that didn't see that, I don't, Matthew, maybe you can pull it up while we're chatting and drop a link. Otherwise, you can go check out um, other videos on the Book Flipper channel on YouTube. We did a video about restock limits, what they are, what you can do about them. But just to recap, if, if you're newer to this, um, Amazon way back several years ago, which, you know, a year or two in this game feels like a long time ago. So a couple years ago, everybody had a limit of 5,000 books. Amazon said, we don't want every seller just to have unlimited inventory. And so you actually had a hard cap in FBA of 5,000 books. If you tried to get over that, there wasn't really a way to get your limits increased unless you sold 8% of your inventory in a week. So just over 1% a day. And you had to do that for nine consecutive weeks. And then you'd get a check mark on your account and you could actually request that they would raise your storage limits and they would go up 60% at a time. So you'd go from 5,000 units to 8,000 to 13,300, whatever that is to, you know, 21,000 and so on and so forth. Um, and it was sort of exponential. And so that was kind of the way to get your limits raised. And we played the game. I know other people played the game where you have a second account and try and, you know, just send in fast moving items and that worked. And then Amazon said, you know what? Unlimited inventory. And they rolled out these IPI or inventory performance index. And that was a way for them to say, hey, if you are, wow, Matthew's quick. They said, if you are um, selling, I got one random hair sticking up. Um, <laughs> they said, if you have good metrics, then you are, you're good to go. You can have unlimited storage. Well, that's hard for Amazon to balance, right? Because literally there's nothing stopping someone as a brand new seller with 500 books in inventory from next week literally sending a truckload of books, 40,000 books, 30,000 books, whatever, to Amazon. And Amazon has tons of warehouse space, except COVID. So COVID has really just accelerated a lot of things. If you guys uh, don't follow Prof G, uh, Matthew, did I get you into Prof G yet? I don't think so. Oh, man. Uh, you need to get into the Prof G po pro uh, podcast, Profcast. Yeah, no, I definitely not listen to the podcast. So it's Scott Galloway and Taylor Smith out of, uh, he's out of Indiana, but he spends most of his time Puerto Vallarta. He's the one that tipped me off. So a little nod to Taylor. Um, check out Prof G, really, really good. And uh, his keyword with COVID is acceleration. And one of the things, you know, for us as, as online sellers, e-commerce took off. And one of the surprising things, we all think that everybody knows how to resell and so much business is done online. The reality is so much business is still done offline. And so if you look at pre-COVID, what percent of total commerce that was done in the U.S., so total retail, uh, what percent of that was e-commerce? Anybody care to hazard a guess? So what percent Sorry. was What percent of all of the guess? retail business in the U.S. is online pre-COVID? So what I, thought, I think it was, was like 12 12 was online is uh, that right you're giving, you're giving away the numbers but yeah it's, it's roughly 10 percent, 12 percent. i was guessing there. i mean i i thought i maybe knew it but sorry yeah we i think we've talked about it uh a couple people were saying 20 30 percent like we just think because we buy so much online that that a big chunk of retail is being done online and pre-covid it was just you know just a little above 10 percent e-commerce doubled last year i think it grew 97 percent. so the share of total commerce now is pushing 20 a little bit north of 20. so again it it was going to get there eventually covid just accelerated that because people were stuck at home and it just made sense so as sellers that's a tremendous opportunity um not just books but anything being bought online and you know of course people stepped on landmines and were trying to sell masks and ppe and uh, there was some members of our community that got in trouble for hoarding and flipping. And there's a, a very fine line between, you know, flipping and then also hoarding things that are essential items. So we all learned that lesson. Hopefully most of you learned it by watching other people instead of actually getting in trouble with it. Um, but so that, that is where e-commerce has gone. So e-commerce doubled last year, which means hopefully everybody's sales are doing pretty well. One of the challenges though, is Amazon's warehouses last year grew 50%. So the, a typical Amazon facility is north of a million square feet, which 
we just throw out big numbers like a million. They're massive. Uh, Google some of the Amazon warehouses and the fulfillment centers. They are unbelievable in terms of their scale. And Amazon last year was very aggressive. They already have, I don't know the numbers, 30-ish, 40-ish warehouses. They increased their, their warehouse space by 50% last year. So 50% growth on an already big number of square foot, square footage, square feetage, whatever it is, a 50% increase normally would have been more than enough, but when e-commerce doubled, they couldn't keep up. So Amazon almost always takes care of customers, right? So the end customer, that's why they offer, you know, really easy refunds. It's super easy to do business there. Kind of hurts us as sellers sometimes, but they always, always, always protect the buyer. That's their number one priority to a fault. Next, every once in a while, they show a little bit of concern and care for their sellers. This was the first time with the restock limits that we saw Amazon actually do something to protect themselves. Okay. Uh, I'm sure there's other examples of them protecting themselves, but in general, it's customers, then a little bit sellers, and then lastly was themselves. And this was really just a protectionist movement or a self-protection uh, piece that we saw Amazon do. So what they're doing is they're saying, hey, you now have limits. If you have great IPI, cool. If your inventory numbers look great, you can have unlimited inventory. But on top of the unlimited inventory, they then said, just kidding, there's actually this thing called restock limits. And that is where we don't really want you sending anything more than you can sell in roughly three months. Well, if you're selling groceries or batteries or replenishables, having three months worth of inventory isn't really a big deal. Many of those items sell lots of times a day. And for you to just throw a bunch in at a time, that seems reasonable. Where it hurts was booksellers. A lot of these books have e-scores of one or two or five or 10. They only sell, you know, a couple of times a month, not several times a day. And so the, just the beta or the volatility or the turn rate in terms of uh, booksellers is much lower. And so as booksellers, most of our style got cramped. Um, newer sellers, I believe, have a restock limit starting at a thousand. And it's not terribly difficult to get that up to 3000 if you're sending in, you know, fast moving inventory. But Amazon rolled this out and pretty much anybody that had more than a couple thousand books in stock was all of a sudden where they had you know 10,000 books in inventory and their restock limits, even with great turn metrics, great IPI, their restock limit might have been like 9,000. So they were just out of reach. You didn't have to take books out of inventory. You could just leave them there. But Amazon said, you know, we're, we're not just going to let you send in unlimited inventory. We are protecting our space and making sure there's room for other things. So Avery, where did, where did you guys land right off the bat with restock limits? I don't, have they really impacted you a whole lot? Yeah, they have. <clears throat> so one of my accounts that is primarily CDs and DVDs, we were at 13,000 before restock limits. And then that dwindled down to 4,000. Now we actually went down to like 3,500, but since we've been sending better stuff in, we worked it back up to 4,000. And you guys know me, I have like seven accounts that I sell on. I think four or five of them are technically my accounts. The other accounts are partnerships, but um, yeah, it, it affected not the textbook accounts. The textbook accounts have been good because textbooks sell often, but the CDs and DVDs, uh, that, that was bad. We, we literally went like, we, sh we did our first shipment, I think two months ago on that account. So how many months is that of no shipments? Uh, That's I think like, restock limits have been in place since I want to say May. Okay. It felt longer than that. I, but maybe, it, maybe like, it's maybe longer. I feel like it's four, been seven four, or eight months, four months, like no shipments at all. Okay. I could have been smarter about it. I, I was more optimistic about what was going to happen. So I didn't purge a lot of inventory, but I probably should have. Yeah. So here, here was my prediction. I don't know that I made it publicly. So Matthew, you'll have to back me up. Just say that, yes, this was absolutely true. When they rolled out, I think it was April. Mike's saying April. I trust him. So uh, April is when they rolled out. I should know that better. Um, Mike's, my, Mike's my data guy. Um, so April, when they rolled out, I said, man, this is probably going to be at least through the summer. It probably goes to early fall by the time Amazon can get out in front of this. So my hunch was that restock limits would you know the pressure would be alleviated probably by the fall is when they figured it out you know it was probably a couple month thing but then we're in the fall and of course q4 is right around the corner so all of you retail arbitragers and wholesalers and private labelers you're loading up and getting everything ready for christmas that is you know black friday and christmas and everything else so i figured at that point there the limits are actually probably going to get worse and we're going to see people uh we're going to see the limits get a little bit harsher as amazon protects their space because everybody's going to try and flood the warehouse 
So my hunch was by the time this actually gets figured out and, and, and relaxed or limited, it's probably going to be looking into January or February. So that was my initial hunch back in April. And I think we're going to be pretty close to that, unfortunately. Um, and we'll see. Uh, if I had to guess, so Mike asked what what my thought was in terms of, uh, you know, when do the limits get released or removed? I don't know that they'll ever get removed. I think once Amazon has put this limit in place, they're going to leave it. If they have tons of space in the warehouse, I bet they just leave it alone and, you know, the restock limits will be, you know, unlimited. Somebody sent me a screenshot this morning where they had, I want to say 999,000 or 999 million units of restock limit. I think that was a glitch. But maybe that's hope that just around the corner we'll actually uh, have a little have breathing room. That that'd be nice. I don't think they'll go back to unlimited. I think they're gonna, you know, put some sort of a, a ridiculously high ceiling and leave themselves the ability to drop that back down. So, uh, Rakin throwing twenty bucks on the table. Thanks, brother. That's uh, thanks hey, for thanks sponsoring so us. Much, uh... So this this podcast is now no longer sponsored by by Restricted Inventory. It's sponsored by <laughs> RakinProfit.com. So thank you, Rakin. Um, so the restock limits, I believe will, will be lifted at least temporarily come January, February. That's my hunch. If they don't, what do you got to do? So I'm kind of like you, Avery, when I, when they first rolled out, I think we had about 12,000 books FBA. I think my restock limits were like 10,500. So a little bit out in front. And I was like, eh, no big deal. I have a lot of long tail inventory. I do have a small, like 3000 square foot warehouse here in Indiana. I had shelves. I'd been doing a little merchant fulfilled. I kind of started dabbling when COVID hit and FBA got restricted. Um, and so uh, I was just like, no big deal. I'll just convert to merchant fulfilled and keep going and I'll slowly get out in front of this. Well, every week I'd sell another couple hundred thousand items, whatever it was. And every week my limits would just keep going down. It was one of those weird games where, you know, my inventory is here, my limits are here. And I'd sell a little bit and I'd get close and then it would drop. And it was every week they just kept dropping. And it was this weird chicken and egg game that I never got out in front of. And that was fine. We just did all merchant fulfilled. Uh, my warehouse guy probably hates me because of that. But we shipped out a lot of orders. We got you know really good at that skill set. And uh, probably six weeks ago, I finally said, all right, this, this definitely isn't clearing up before uh, January. It's time. You know, There's a lot of books that you do get that prime bump. It's time to open it up. So I went in. Uh, a little friendly shout out to our restock tool that we built. So restock.thebookflipper.com, a free tool. We do take tips. We're all about tips around here, but you can totally use it for free. Pilfer it, use it on us. Um, it's a great just tool to go in there and, and uh, remove inventory. So you can do that. It generates the report. You can upload it and just dispose of inventory. You can send it to Romer. We'll give you his address and just you know flood his parents' house if you'd like as well. They would love the inventory. <laughs> Uh, there's probably an address in Des Plaines, Illinois, that many of you know about that maybe we could, you know, drop some inventory to them as well. They probably like it. But I finally went in and did a, a ruthless call. Calling is what the library term is, C-U-L-L. -L. So I went in and uh, removed a ton of inventory, got out in front of the game. And so I got my inventory below where that limit was. And then I, I was able to actually free up room because it's a double-edged sword. Once you've been sitting for four or five months, the inventory that's in there is pretty stagnant and you're not gonna hit that 1% a day sell-through rate. You're not gonna hit 20% a month. It's just not happening. And so at some point you just have to bite the bullet and get out in front of it. We removed a ton of inventory, stuff that had dropped in price or just the, you know, it was sitting forever and wasn't likely to sell. I kept the fast movers in if they were still left and I kept the more expensive inventory in but that allowed us to get out in front. We were able to send in a small batch of four or 500 units. And then we actually saw our limits start to go back up because we had fresh inventory that was selling. So if you guys are in a pinch, keep in mind that once your inventory is getting stale and stagnant, you're gonna have to do something drastic or at this point, wait it out. So there's a little link right there. Look at that. Restock.thebookflipper.com. Again, totally free tool. Feel free to throw something in our tip jar. Uh, Matthew will use it for some personal improvement books or some jujitsu training for Avery. <laughs> um, so if you guys want that, check that out. It's a, again, a really good tool to just get a handle on what's in your inventory. And if you do want to make some removals, you can do that. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we've done. Matthew, have you played a around a whole lot with some of the restock limits and, and trying to get out in front of that? Restock limits for my account have always been just above, uh, where inventory is i don't think we've 
actually hit the limits yet, but we've gotten close, I think, a few times. It's always been just above. Most of my account is textbooks, though, so they sell fairly quickly. Um, so as the turn rate's higher, so the limits, I think, are in favor of that. But yeah. it's always just above it. It's not It's not like we have a drastic gap between. Yeah, it's, it's very strange. It always seems like they just they they have like two to three hundred units, but no matter how much we send in, it's always a little bit. Yeah, it always that. just bumps up or whatever sent in. So it's it's working in our, my favor right now, but we'll see if it continues to do that. I think it's because the turn rate is a little bit higher, so they're allowing more uh, restock versus leaving a lot of slower moving items in inventory. Would probably start decreasing it. Or or maybe the uh, Christmas bribe that you sent to your Amazon rep paid off it could, be. it could very much be that too blackmail is also involved so that might, <laughs> might help a little bit too so there's uh those are several things you can you can kind of play with um i do think it's important if you want to spread risk so again we've talked about you know every year there seems to be something big that goes on with amazon and some kind of a challenge so um this year it seems to be the year of restock limits and we'll see what next year brings it's you know it's always fees increasing or more sellers entering the market or, or something right counterfeit books. So uh, one of the things you can do to hedge your bets is there is no limits for merchant fulfilling. And even if you don't have a lot of space, I've just got a, a small bedroom here. That's my home office. I could fit easily a thousand books in this space. Right. Yeah. And if not, I could, you know, put bookshelves all around the entire perimeter and fit at least, you know, five, six, seven, 800 books. So it's pretty easy to have even just a small inventory to try and ramp up if you are a newer seller starting at a thousand books, make sure you're not just sending in junk. You know, when we, when most of us start, we're just excited. We don't really pay attention to sales rank and e-score. We just send stuff in and go, Hey, it might sell. Um, Amazon wants you to be a little more cautious with it. So be, be careful there or send everything, you know, especially low profit stuff. That's not going to sell. <laughs> there we go. All right. Look at that. You got me. Who wants to do a hundred dollar sponsorship? Can we get a hundred? <laughs> We're at ninety nine ninety nine. We got a little. Go one here. penny up, and they've now sponsored it. <laughs> uh, I that was the only color there. that I had to pay a hundred to get it red. It was a hundred to get red. Okay. That. So, <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I lost my train of thought. Where were we? You got to <laughs> split that with Matthew. I will. I'm good for it. <laughs> Oh, uh, I, I had something to comment on that, though, because sure. uh, you've always talked about how uh, the 2080 rule, but I forget the exact numbers. I think I've screwed this up the more times I tell this story. But you, you did like an experiment on a bulk seller a few years ago, and you found out I think it was 40 percent of their inventory accounted for 3 percent of their profit. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, roughly, roughly correct. Yeah, OK, yeah. yeah so if, if like if that's true, then the restock limit really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Yes, they're terrible for bulk booksellers who are primarily FBA. But if you add it merchant fulfilled and more importantly, you focus on higher profit inventory, it probably wouldn't affect your business that much. You know, like if, if you truly I know it sucks to like if you're running a bulk operation to say, hey, we're not going to accept 40 percent of the material we used to. But according to the data that that you showed on that one account, it it would actually like they probably pay less to their employees. Uh, who knows what they could do with those books? Maybe they're still sending them to sell back your book or maybe they're sending them to a recycle or maybe they're doing nothing with them, you know, but at least they're not having to deal with them as much. Uh, so arguably they can make more money just by not focusing on that bottom 40 percent. Like I almost think it would be worse if somebody transitioned to MF and just tried to to collect as much material as they wanted to, as they did before. Uh, but they're still dealing with that 40% of inventory. That's not ever going to be that profitable anyway. So by adding MF, now you're actually spending more time doing it, you know? So I, I think definitely cutting some of the fat, I think, I mean, would you agree that most bulk sellers should do that and have any bulk sellers actually taken that advice from you and, and you've seen the results? Uh, not as much. So real quick shout out, Scott Taylor. Thanks for the tip as well. If you guys want to get featured here, Bill, I'm waiting for your sponsorship. I'm going to drop a little, uh, sell back your <laughs> yeah. book love here, but he's uh, got to do always, 200 to get the green though. He's, he's, for, he's always been kind to us. Um, is it color coded based on the value? It you is. Give? At least that that's how uh, I interpret it. What's the most expensive color? It should be orange for Scout IQ, well, clearly. If you look at $20 is like a light orange and then it gets darker orange and then it's bright red so oh, actually 
Bill, Bill can do it relatively cheap for five dollars. He can get a green super chat. So oh, there it is. And no green excuses. is their color, so that that's kind of fitting. Um, let me. I'm going to bring out my the the iPad since uh, you know it's a business write off, so I have to make sure I'm using it. Let me uh, share that, and we'll talk about that. So that's a a really good point, Avery. Let me. All right, is that showing up? Yep. Look yep. at that. Cool. You guys have to deal with my uh, terrible writing. So to your point, so here, here's the question when it comes to, to books, right? Or really anything that's inventory based. You've got a Gaylord of books. There's a nice box on a pallet. And the question is, which books should you sell online? Well, you're going to go through these. And in general, we've got a lot of data on bulk sellers. You're going to have about 15% of your books that are uh, Amazon worthy, whether that's and if you do, you know, FBA and Merchant Fulfilled, maybe that goes up a little bit. We've got some wholesaler integrations. So you're going to have roughly 15-ish to 20% that are going to go to wholesale. So that's like a sell back your book, um, zip it, any of the vendors you're going to see on Bookscouter. And then typically you're going to be throwing away the remainder, which if my math is accurate, we're going to be talking about 65-ish to 70%. You're going to be trashy. So uh, recycling, we don't like to trash books. C-Y-C-L-E, if I can spell. So the question is, and what we did is we analyzed someone's numbers and they they had, you know, we get accurate data down to the penny uh, in terms of what the Amazon payouts are going to be. We don't know which books are going to sell. There's always a risk. I think the biggest um, thing you have to take into account on an inventory game, uh, it's a business, but it's a game. The inventory game is risk. So the more sure you are of something, the higher the e-score, the more often it sells, the more likely it is to, to pay out whatever it's estimating quickly the more long tail it is. So if it's got an e-score of one or two, it sells once every couple of months. Even if it looks like it might make you $10, then you probably shouldn't be listing it necessarily because the risk of it selling or the chances of it selling are very low. And so you need higher profits to offset the risk. So what happens is um, in any sort of inventory, you always have the cream on top, right? So you've got a, a chunk of your inventory that's extremely high, high value. Those are the you know fifty dollar books that you pull out. They're you know fifty dollars merchant fulfilled, you know seventy bucks FBA, and those books you're anybody's going to find, right? You find those on the thrift store shelves. That's what we're all in the game for. But that's just such a small percentage of your business. So the eighty twenty rule says that eighty percent of your profits this is also called the Pareto principle. Eighty percent of your profits come from twenty percent of your efforts. So what does this mean? That means if you look at your top 20% of your units, so if you sell 1,000 units in a month, look at your top 200 units, and I would hazard a guess that roughly 80% of your profit comes from that little chunk of your uh, efforts. So the question is, like, what are you after? And that, that's what you have to ask in general. Like, we always like to post our numbers and show the high sales or the high units that we've sold. What are you really after, though? Like, do you want money in the bank or do you just want a vanity metric that looks cool? So if you're chasing, hey, I need to get 100 books a week, right? You follow our content, you see that, that challenge. If you're trying to get 100 books a week, you're going to be doing that no matter what. DA Walk, thank you. Getting a lot of tips. Look what you started, uh, Steve, Mr. Rakin. So appreciate that. Hey, to be fair, I was I was trying to figure that out before Steve even came <laughs> in. <here. laughs> you know, well, it didn't go. work at first because I had my VPN on. So my VPN oh, also was, wouldn't was, let you. Uh, it was trying to make pay in uh, in in euros at first, and, and I was oh, like, nice. "What's going on?" Is here? well, I mean, Rome. I don't have it. I got a fifty euro that you paid me in in Tucson, and I'm oh, still yeah. sitting on. <laughs> uh, so the the question is: All right, if eighty percent of your profits come from twenty percent of your efforts, how do you spend more of your time doing leverage things like the twenty percent? And so what we looked at, I looked at a bulk seller and they'll remain nameless because they don't want to be uh, shown. John Muscarello, side hustle experiment, 20 bucks. Go follow him on Instagram. Loving the stash. Don't encourage this. It will stay. <laughs> um, so the question is on a bulk seller, they were looking at it and they were willing to scrape the bottom of the barrel. So one of the questions that we get asked quite a bit, and if you're in bulk, go ahead and comment. What is the, the minimum profit? What's the floor profit that you're looking for when you're scanning books? Okay. So that question will kind of factor into your business decisions. So uh, Matthew, can you throw the, uh, yeah, yeah. the fancy writing back in there again? So what's the minimum profit that you're willing to sell? Anybody have any uh, comments there? Or for those of you that source in the field as well, what's the minimum profit that's worth your time to kind of get into that? Michael Scott Rapp with seven bucks. Thanks for the tip. This is getting fun. Mike Kreider with $1.35. 
or that's what he's saying. Never mind. I thought we we're getting all these tips. I got excited. Oh, <laughs> you're disappointed. Uh, Seven dollars <laughs> for Michael Scott. Nice. Mike Kreider says a buck thirty-five. Someone says five to eight bucks. So in a typical distribution of books, if we pulled them out of a Gaylord and said, hey, you know, the books that are going to be greater than $20 profit, it's going to be just a very small percentage of books, right? So we got just, you know, a couple books. Look at all those books. If we're looking at books that are going to make, you know, at least $5, there is a lot of books. So a giant pile of books, right? So there's more books that'll make five bucks. If you're willing to scrape and go down to a dollar, now you're looking at just tons and tons and tons of books. There's, there's lots of books. So you can improve your accept rates, but again, what are you really after? If you scan a Gaylor to books, you know, 600, 800 books, whatever that is. If you scan that many books, do you really care what your percent accept rate is? Is that the metric we're trying to optimize for? Or are you trying to pull the most profit out? So kind of the age old question is if I, if I gave you a Gaylor to books, 800 books and said, your job is to maximize the profit from this Gaylor. You could probably do that, right? You could actually find a use. Some people would buy the books for the colors. You could you know, put a bunch of the kids' books that don't have Amazon value and lump them together and sell them on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. If you absolutely had to, you could probably find a way to monetize every single book in the Gaylord. But it's just going to be decreasing efforts because at some point, Bill with $100. <laughs> New thanks, sponsor. Bill. Uh, Bill and I will be visiting each other next week. So uh, we may go live at some point. So look for that. That'll be fun. Looking forward to some time together there. Um, where was I? If you know, you can get your accept rates really, really high because the number of books that are going to be greater than twenty dollars might be, you know, two percent of the books you're going to scan. Above five dollars might be, you know, six to eight percent. I'm just, I'm just throwing out rough numbers. Over a dollar, you might get your accept rate up to like fifteen to twenty percent. And if you're willing to say, hey, if I can make, you know, ten cents of profit, you might actually get an accept rate that's pushing like thirty-three percent. That's what we call a vanity metric. So if you're willing to scrape the bottom of the barrel and send that stuff into Amazon, you can have awesome accept rates. But what are you giving up when you do that? What's your time worth? What's that labor worth to now list that book and, and send it in Merchant Fulfilled or FBA? What's your shipping going to cost to do that? What's your labor worth to pull it back off the shelf and ship it out? What's your return rate? It's low, but it's still going to be something that impacts your overall expenses. And it affects the restock limits too. Uh, for sure. Especially if it's low moving stuff, you're like, Hey, it's got an e-score of two, but I can make 25 cents. So the bulk seller that I analyzed and the data was roughly that it was like, it was like something like 40% of their units because they were willing to scrape the bottom of the barrel and send anything in. I think their minimum profit was 25 cents. So they're going, Hey, if I can make 25 cents, I'm going to send it to Amazon or, or list it merchant fulfilled 40% of their units were generating. I think it was like 4% of their profit. So we looked at those numbers and said, man, nearly half, over a third of your effort, 40% of your effort, your time, your labor, your overhead, the shelf space required, uh, all of that is generating this much profit. So if we removed 40% of your labor and your efforts, you would probably not notice a 4% hit to your bottom line, right? And they said, well, no, not really. I said, great. We're going to raise our floor price from 10 cents or 25 cents, I think was theirs. We're going to raise that to you know something like, 90 cents. And then we're going to redo the analysis again in a couple months. And I think we ended up settling closer to a dollar 10. I think that ended up being roughly the sweet spot. There's no magic number. It's just what you're willing to do. The beautiful thing is on, uh, on scout IQ and on some bulk tools and whatnot, there's vendors like sell back your book that, you know, are generous and donate a hundred bucks, but they're also going to throw 25 cents at you or a dollar 10 or $2 or five bucks. They're going to buy some of these books. And if they're going to be, you know, if your floor price is a buck 10 to be worth it at your size of your operation, at your shipping rates, um, they might offer you 70 cents and they'll take that risk. You know, they're going to pay 70 cents and maybe they're smarter than you and find other other avenues to sell it. They certainly have cheaper shipping rates. Maybe they're more efficient at picking orders, but you can now get that yield. You can get your yield up to 35, 40 percent and just push the risk onto somebody else and they'll pay you for the for the the, the privilege. So that's that's kind of the 80-20 rule and what it looks at. And for most of us, I, I know when people are starting off, one of the big questions we get is where do you find bulk books? But for most of us, books are everywhere. We can find more books. We can find more thrift stores. We can travel a bit and get access to more sources or, or put posts on Facebook Marketplace. Um, I'll just put this out into the universe. There is a uh, Riley Brown. If you're watching, say hello. 
Uh, Seattle Bookman is, uh, he's a guest we need to get on here. He's done a phenomenal job at finding books locally, taking out ads. Uh, he, he's, he's been great. So if he's still out there, someone asked me if he's even in business anymore. It's been a while since we've chatted. So Riley, if you're anywhere in the universe, is. if you're watching, I, I talked say to hello. him this summer. Uh, okay. We, we were buying chlorine in Seattle. So I wanted to oh, drop nice. off the chlorine at his warehouse, but he's busy. I think he said, don't quote me on this, but I think he said he has like 30 people working for him now or something. It, it wouldn't surprise me. He's very, uh, very entrepreneurial, very smart and uh, had a pretty good network. So Riley, we need to hang out soon. I want to interview you, but I, I want to come and say, hey, you've, you've been a good inspiration as well, just in terms of what's possible. So going back to the question, if I gave you one Gaylor to books, 800 books and said, your job is to maximize the profit from these books. And that's the only books you're going to get for the entire month. Well, at some point you should just stop, right? You can sell, you know, 10 to 15% on Amazon. Great. You know, that's awesome. You can sell some on eBay. You can sell some Facebook marketplace. You could probably do like a local book sale for a buck a piece. You could eventually find somebody that would buy every single book in there. But once you get past the cream, you're going to be working with the skim milk and, you know, the cheese curds and whatever else I, that, that analogy breaks down at some point. But at some point, you're going to be working really hard to try and scrape the bottom of the barrel and get that last possible dollar out of it. So what do we do instead? Well, we work our way through Gaylord number one and we call up our supplier and say, can I get Gaylord number two? So now the game is how quickly can I scrape the cream out of Gaylord number one so that I'm able to move on to number two and three and four? And if you are if you are understanding the 80-20 principle, it's more about how can we get through this this value and this volume of books to pull out the best of the best and have good systems for, for monetizing the rest. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the lesson there. Did that answer your question, Avery? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Um, Where else can we go with this? Well, what, what was, what was the uh, actual profit they saw? Um, what was the difference in, did they save a lot of time and did they make more profit? Was that like the, did, and they, did they stick with it? The results of that experiment? Um, yeah, what happened was they raised their their minimum target profit. So on their triggers, instead of going down to 25 cents because, hey, I'm going to make 25 cents and I'll take 25 cents, it's sunk cost. I already bought the Gaylor to books. We already have to touch the book to scan it. So, you know, off we go. Scott says basically the idea of opportunity cost. Absolutely. Exactly. What's your time worth? And, and a really good ex exercise as well is, you know, measure some of these things. I'm a big, big fan of you can't measure what you don't or you can't manage what you don't measure. So have measurements in place and understand what, what does it take you to list a hundred books? Don't do it with just one book because you can quickly, you know, go really, really fast on one book, but measure something over an hour and try and figure out how many books can I list in an hour, right? And even if you don't have employees, think about what your time is worth. What salary do you want to be making? If you want to be making 60 grand a year and you work 30 hours a week, which is kind of a joke for entrepreneurs because most of us work way more than 40. But if you want to work 40 hours a week and make 60 grand, then your time is worth $30 an hour. You just divide by, you know, 2000 or two. So if your time is worth $30 an hour and you can list 60 books in an hour, then it costs you 50 cents a book to list it of, of labor time, right? Where that gets tricky is when you start to pick orders on a merchant fulfilled uh, operation. And then you've got to put that in an envelope, uh, pay for shipping, print it out, throw in a bucket. All of a sudden, your labor cost to pick and ship that order, if you're not crazy efficient or if you're not doing a ton of them, it might only take you four minutes. But if you're paying someone $15 an hour, that costs you $1 in terms of labor cost. And that doesn't even factor in the envelope price and the number of returns and everything else. So if it's going to cost you a dollar to pick that order, and if you guys want to check my math, if you're paying $15 an hour, that means you're paying $1 every four minutes. If it takes you four minutes to find an order on the shelf, pull it out, walk over, find the order on Amazon, print out uh, postage, slap it on there, right? I'm sure you could speed that up. Maybe you could get closer to 30 or 40 or 50 books in an hour in terms of shipping them out. But if you're a little bit slower, you've got to be factoring in a dollar in terms of labor costs. So your, your floor profit now doesn't need to be 25 cents or a dollar. It better start at a dollar and ideally be more. The goal is not to sell books. The goal is to make money. Now, the only other consideration that comes into play is with restock limits is sometimes you're not really chasing the dollars in terms of profit. You're trying to chase fast moving inventory so that you can have room to send in more profitable stuff. And the same thing when it comes to uh, merchant fulfilled, 
if you're able to hit volume metrics, typically, you know, two to three to 400 books in a day, you can start to save on outbound shipping. So media mail will cost you about $3 and 30 cents for a one pound item. You're able to get those costs down depending on your volume. In some cases you can save 50 cents to a dollar on over media mail costs. So sometimes it's worth selling books that you're not making a ton of money on just so you can hit certain volume thresholds, right? That that's what we call economies of scale. But for most of us that are solopreneurs or, you know, it's just you, or maybe just you and a significant other or a business partner, maybe you have one or two employees. It's really important to look at the numbers and understand what that is. And I, I would say almost everybody, you're better off raising your floor price and trying to value your time a little bit more and spend more of your time pursuing higher dollar activities rather than just spinning your wheels, trying to make a few pennies here and there. So that's, that's, uh, that's kind of bulk 101. And that's kind of the 80, 20 rule applied to it is trying to find more valuable books out there. All right. What other, what other questions are there? So I guess bottom line, we'll kind of tidy up the restock limits conversation. Then we'll jump in and, and take some questions as well. Thanks of those, for those of you that are here again, as Raken would say, smash that like button. Don't forget to like, and subscribe and all those good things. Romer, how do people find you? Uh, you just type in Romer the Roamer on Google, YouTube, Facebook, RomerTheRomer.com, uh, everywhere. TikTok, wherever you are, just type in Roamer. It'll pop Perfect. up. So definitely follow him. Matthew, how do people find you? Everything is just Matthew Osborne, every platform. Look at that. <laughs> Perfect. Very, very simple. And uh, you can find me, uh, The Book Flipper, but you're already on my channel, so you know you already found me. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe. Those things matter. So to tidy up, we'll take a bunch of questions here and kind of get you know get to some of your other questions that are here. But to wrap up the restock limits piece is I don't think these, if I had to guess, if I was putting money on it, I don't think the limits are going to clear up until after Q4, so after Christmas. I would suspect, uh, and I'm hopeful that the limits will ease quite a bit as we get into January and February. And of course, I think Amazon's going to keep that as a, a backdoor option. And that, that's going to come back if their warehouses get cluttered again, then we're going to see it pop back up. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some sort of a piece of that happening every every time we get close to Q4. Yeah. Um, so in short, and I'll give one other strategy that we didn't talk about yet. So make sure you're sending in higher e-score material to FBA. I think if you haven't, if you've been steering clear of doing merchant fulfillment, you should probably give that a shot. Um, but again, don't scrape the bottom of the barrel. Merchant fulfilled is great to have. Um, I forget what I've called this in the past. My memory's failing as I get older, but it's nice to have a high dollar, just a shelf of merchant fulfilled kind of long tail superstars. So if you've got a bunch of stuff that's e-score of, you know, maybe under six, eight, 10, that has a potential profit of 20, 30, 40 bucks, even though you're like, I don't want to ship merchant fulfilled orders. I bet for 20, 30, $40 every once in a while where you get a sale, you're like, sweet. I don't mind walking over to my shelf to, you know, go pick up a $20 bill. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, I think it's important to flex that muscle, have a merchant fulfilled shelf. You can turn it on vacation mode. If you're going to be away for a while, it's, it's really easy to do your FBA inventory can keep selling. I think it's important to kind of to branch out and Amazon's making it clear. Don't rely on FBA 100% of the time. Um, and so that, that's a good balance for you. The other thing is if you're going to sell FBA, uh, you can actually sell items outside of books. I know that's shocking to many of you, but you can find replenishable. So grocery items that people buy regularly, like coffee pods, uh, Keurig pods, for example, uh, batteries. There's a lot of like small toys, small items that sell quickly. And so that is something you can do is you can actually, if you have some capacity to send more books in or more items, you can actually use some of that capacity to send in fast moving items like vitamins and whatever you're approved for. Send a bunch of those in as those sell, that'll actually help your overall restock limits. So we've seen cases where that happens. Um, and so that's, that's something you can definitely do on the side to kind of help boost your FBA metrics in order to send more inventory in. That's good. You ready for some questions? Let's let's take some questions. We've been yakking for about an hour. Of course, we we started with a bunch of uh, nonsense as well. So um, we'll keep we'll keep chatting. I, I'm happy to go for a bit. Avery, is it is it past your bedtime yet, or you got a little <laughs> bit of time yet? We're we're good for a while. I got my workout coming this afternoon, but perfect. Nice. This cool. Good. All right. Brian says, "What's up? Uh, what's been your experience with cross listing plus, plus merchant fulfillment?" Wouldn't it be wise to price differently depending on the platform since they take different percentage of sales? 
So cross-listing, meaning you, you have one piece of inventory with a SKU and ad, an address on your shelves. You're listing it on multiple channels. So surprise people buy books outside of Amazon. The number two platform is going to be eBay. And then, you know, the, the rest of the business gets split among, you know, Facebook marketplace is legit. I know some of you actually have uh, some Shopify stores that you're selling inventory. Abe, Alibris, I think half.com went out of business. Uh, I think eBay shut them down. So you can sell books on multiple platforms there. I believe Amazon's got some rules. I might sound like an idiot if I'm wrong on this one, but I think Amazon says you can't have cheaper prices on other platforms. I don't know how they necessarily monitor that. I think they tried that and I think they got in trouble. By I saying. know there's some lawsuits because it should be free market and, and et cetera, but you can totally list things elsewhere. eBay has cheaper fees than Amazon. Um, Amazon's going to be 15% plus $1.80 plus no FBA fees. eBay, I believe, is 10% for books. So it's a little bit cheaper. Um, so you can sell books for the same price on other platforms and actually pocket more money, which is awesome. So I know Acceler List does some cross-listing. I know Joe Lister does it. I believe NidoScan does it. So there's some other software out there you can use to cross-list. Personally, I don't have a ton of experience. We'll have to get David Chung on here. I know he's got a ton of experience. Maybe we could get Bill on here from Sell Back Your Book. He probably wouldn't share all of their, their secrets, uh -huh. but... Um, can you price differently on the platform? Sure. If your software allows for it. Um, ultimately if a book is selling for eight bucks on Amazon, but goes for 10 on eBay, that's the going rate. You should sell it for 10. You should take advantage of a higher profit, uh, a higher sales price as well as a higher profit because the fees are lower. What other questions do we have? Eric Sullivan says, do you match Amazon price if Scout IQ says to do? So are you still going to go slightly lower? So Scout IQ's default triggers aren't going to match exactly Amazon's price. It's set up by default to be Amazon minus 10%, but you yep. can change that within the triggers based on your preference. But yeah, so Scout IQ wouldn't tell you to match the exact Amazon price. It'll always bump that down a little bit if that's the target price is referencing with the triggers. Yeah, this sounds like a fun game. I know there's Simon says, we should have a Scout IQ says game. Um, <laughs> guys, Scout IQ is, you know, it's not like, it's, it's Jeff Bezos in there or Matthew in there, like telling you what to do on each individual book. It's just algorithmic triggers uh, based on historical demand for a book. So you'll see some crazy prices sometimes like a hundred dollar prime price and, you know, a $5 merchant fulfilled price. That doesn't mean you can sell it for a hundred. It's just going to target that and say, you should still buy the book. Someone's going to buy it, whether you can sell it for 10 or 12 or 15, that's up to you. Maybe somebody will pay a hundred. I, I doubt it. So it's important to understand what the triggers are saying and make your decisions. But to your question, do I match Amazon? I do stay a little bit away because if someone can buy a brand new book from Amazon directly, a prime book for 10 bucks, why are they going to buy my used copy of a book for 10 bucks? Right. Um, I do see sometimes on really popular books where the rank is sub 100, where the used price will actually go higher than the new price. Cause some people just assume yeah, that, that happened with uh, the subtle art of not giving an F. Yeah, that, that yeah. Book, I've, I've sold that book several times uh, by accident more. We, <laughs> yeah, we work with some libraries and it's pretty common when the rank is so good. And what happens is people just assume that used is cheaper than new and they don't even look at new. They go, I'm not going to buy a new book and pay all that money. They just pull up the used page and buy the cheapest copy. So we've had copies of like popular fiction books that we're selling for 25, 30 bucks when Amazon's on the listing for 17. Um, is that a, a strategy you can use all the time? Not really in terms of high demand. Yeah. That, that can tend to happen as well. Yeah. You want to grab this one, Avery? Uh, I'm so green in Amazon. <laughs> just wanted to know the higher sales rank, uh, good or bad. Generally higher sales rank is bad. And this actually ties into, uh, somebody else asked a question is, uh, is it worth paying for Keepa? So it's worth paying for Keepa if you want to investigate high sales rank books. So for example, there's this Jewish set that I always like to use as, as an example. I think it was five or 6 million rank when I purchased it. I spent $150 on it. Why would I spend $150 on a book that has a 5 million plus rank or a set of books? The reason why I did it is because I looked at Keepa and I saw that over the years, like literally over a decade, I saw it had sales consistently. Sometimes it only sold once a year. Sometimes it sold twice a year, but I knew eventually it would sell. So you can go high sales rank. Um, Caleb would say merchant fulfill it. Uh, I personally think that if you send in like a super high sales rank book that has very low number of offers, so like three or four offers or less, um, and they're all merchant fulfilled, none of them are FBA. I I personally would send something like that FBA, especially if the price is right, because people will pay a premium. 
uh, I know Caleb kind of disagrees with this. You say if, if something's high sales rank, you can't get too much of a premium for it. But I sold the Jewish set for an additional uh, $700. The lowest price was $1,300, and I sold it for $700 prime. And I don't know why somebody bought it, but I, I think that people trust the Amazon Prime check. And I, I think this might be why, actually. I think for a higher value book, I think people associate the Prime check with with like value and authenticity and speed. Obviously, you get the two-day shipping. So, um, yeah, I, I recommend going after high value books. But, you know, Merchant Fulfill them if they're not super expensive. And if they are expensive and you want to take my advice, experiment with pricing them higher Prime and uh, see if it works out for you. And and to tie into the question of the Keepa graph, yes, it's worth it if you use it. All it takes is a couple. If you use it two or three times a month, it's worth it. I pay seventeen about $17 a month for it, and I use it probably at least once or twice a month. And guys, there's a free version of Keepa. It doesn't have all the data, but it's called Chart IQ. It's yeah, yeah, that's included, great. It's, it's included natively thing. in Scout yeah. IQ. You can still see the rank drop in the price. And, and you guys have a Chrome extension too. Is does that? Is that we do. Or? Yep, it still works. So works, Keepa yeah. has way more data than we do. Um, but you guys have like two years of data now. We do, and it's not on every single item like Keepa has, but we we've got pretty good data there. And you know, if you want just a poor man's version and, and you're tight on money, great. Uh, I think Keepa's worth it as well. But again, everybody's at different stages of the business. Real yeah. quick, Avery, to uh, to address your question, real quick. Um, you know, why would somebody pay that much of a premium on a, a long tail book, something that doesn't sell that often? I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of it's removing risk. If someone's going to spend 700 bucks or a thousand bucks on a, on a set of books, they know that when they buy prime, it's going to be super easy to return it if there's any issues. So it just kind of takes the risk and the hassle away from working with a seller. Although now Amazon forces merchant fulfilled sellers to accept returns just like FBA. And so Amazon auto refunds it auto ships it back to you, takes the money right out of your account. Uh, again, Amazon prioritizes the buyers for sure. Um, in general, you, you guys can always find you know examples. I would say in general, you don't want to price a $10 merchant fulfilled book that normally sells for 10 bucks. Uh, you know, asking for a hundred or 50 is probably too much of a premium. And, you know, every time I say that someone sends a screenshot and says, well, I just sold this one for 89 bucks with an e-score of two. And I go, yeah, that, that works, right? There's always going to be exceptions or outliers to any, any kind of rule. I would just say as a general rule, it's not good to price higher than Amazon. As a general rule, longer tail inventory, you probably don't want to ask that much of a premium. Uh, but experiment, and especially on high dollar books like that, you know, asking for a premium of 40 or 50% in your case worked. Actually, yours is more like 80 or 90 or 100 percent. So yeah. um, as a general rule, I don't th I think the, the lower the e-score, i.e. the higher the rank, the less of a prime bump you're going to get. But again, all it takes is one or two to make your make your day to make your month. So Antoine, it's been two to three years since I last sold books on Amazon. What do you suggest for someone starting over? Uh, depends on what your restock limits are. I'm going to guess they're down to a thousand unless you're selling other categories right now. I don't know if you're still been selling on Amazon. Um, books are kind of the gateway drug. They're easy to get started. They're plentiful. It can be harder to ramp up books compared to other products right now with you know how hot everything else is. So as we're getting into Q4, it, you might just want to stick to toys or you know popular products that you're used to right now and then kind of dabble with books. The margins in books are really, really good. You know, there's not a lot of other industries, not a lot of other products that you can be buying books, you know, items regularly for a buck or two and selling them for 15 to 20 to 30. Um, it just is hard to scale. So if you love the thrill of the hunt, if you're a little nervous about business and don't have a lot of money, um, I think books are a fantastic way to get started. And then once you have some some cash, I know people that can you know ramp up books and we say goodbye to people all the time that are getting out of books and deciding to try other categories and uh, you know, that's what, whether you're here for the long term or just as a, a gateway drug or an entry level, that's great. So uh, I would suggest if you want to get back into books, find ways to get books before they go to the thrift stores, find ways to go upstream. If you can do that, you're going to uh, you're going to stand out from competition. You're going to do a really good job there. Mike W with the twenty dollar super sticker. I don't know what that means, except for 20 bucks. Matthew, is this going to make my my monthly uh, sales on YouTube look really good, like my ad revenue, or does this show up separately? I think it shows up separately than ad revenue, but that is a good, we'll have to check that and see how I've been, uh, be uh, Matthew's a lot more knowledgeable. He's more of an expert when it comes to growing a, a, a YouTube channel. I think I do like a video every other month or so. So 
Uh, this will be interesting to see the metrics. Yeah. But thanks, Mike. Brian says, would it be worth getting ungated in grocery to push our IPI higher? How much quick moving inventory would I need to bring up the restock limit? You don't need a ton. Um, I talked to a seller that will remain nameless unless he or she or they want to uh, want to share. But they uh, kind of in the similar boat had many thousand books in inventory, many thousands of books in inventory. And the restock limits were you know lower than what they had. So they just kept having to sell. Well, they were carved out a bunch. And I think their limits got down under 2,000. So they were chased all the way back down. They cleared out some space. And I think they sent in a couple hundred items that sell quickly. And they were able to get their limits relatively quickly. I think within less than a month, we're able to get the limits back up north of 10,000 units. What they did say is once they sent books in, it actually kind of cut directly against that restock limit. So Amazon saying, hey, we see what you're doing. But if you're selling enough fast moving inventory, and it doesn't have to be that much, it's basically whatever you're selling in, in um, in three months. So if you could take a week and multiply it by 12, whatever you're getting in, in three months is kind of what your limits are going to be. They, they don't want to be sitting on inventory for a year at a time. They want two to three months worth. Yeah. Uh, saw a few of these earlier. New price 2.0 is still in the works. It's getting a whole lot closer. We have like three users testing right now. We'll hopefully be able to open that up to a larger group in the very near future. Um, if all goes well, maybe even by next week, be able to open it up to a much bigger group of users. So check your email if you're a current customer of New Price, um, and we'll let you know when that is open uh, for testing. And I think our uh, New Price developer is actually watching right now. So hello, mysterious unnamed person. Thanks for all of your efforts. If you are watching, we, yes. we do really appreciate you more than you know. Definitely. I, I have a comment on New Price. Maybe you guys already do this. And this could be used for Palette IQ as well. But what if you took all of the data from the sales history of of people using the software? So you like look at at least for like a year of their sales data, so you know what the item sold for. Then you compare it against Keepa's data. So Keepa says the item we know that it sold for 50, at least fifteen dollars. The lowest used price on Keepa was fifteen. But you have access to somebody's account or maybe multiple people's accounts where you know that they sold it prime for 18, 20, 22, whatever. And then you can use that as like, it'd be called like historical sales data of users. And then, or maybe even just for yourself personally, you know, you've sold the book in the past for, for 80 bucks, but the current price is 50. But you know that a year ago, the current price was 50 and you sold it for 80. So perhaps you shouldn't price it at, 50 bucks or 60 bucks, you should price it at 80 to get the sale again. Does that make sense? Hmm. Crowdsourced historical data. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. We'll leave it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We've thought about it. Uh, somebody says, can you make cover scanning better on scout IQ? Uh, potentially Amazon doesn't open up their API in terms of like with the sellers, the seller app, you can use the cover scanner. On Scout IQ, it's just grabbing the text. So the, the best thing I can say is if you're going to use the cover scanning recognition, you want to hold the phone, you know, kind of hold it back, set it to ISBN or leave it on barcode, fill the book in the center of the screen and then switch over to the cover. It's going to grab the text immediately. So try, try and have the big words and, and the main text on the cover visible. And it's just going to read whatever it can see. Um, I think it's much better just to use the voice text if you're going to try to. Yeah, speech to just, text just is going to be great. It. And you yeah. can just actually read the keywords, you know, if it's a, a short history of millennial dissertation, something, just pick the big words out of that and it, it'll typically find it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the OCR with the ISBNs is awesome. So if you have an ISBN on the back of a book without a barcode, or if you can open to the back of the title page, it's going to get that nine and a half out of 10 times versus the cover search. It's just, we're using Google's OCR algorithms and yep. you know, sometimes they're better than others. I find a lot of success with the cover one if I just flip to that first title page within the mm -hmm. book because it's clearer text than just trying to do the front cover of the book. It always scans a lot faster and normally gets a little more accurately. Yep. My restock limit as a new seller is 3K. That's really good. At 1K inventory right now, should I be worried about them clamping down to 1K? Um, I wouldn't lose sleep over it, but I would be consistently dripping in or sending in you know, inventory. We always talk about feeding the beast. So I would be sure to keep feeding inventory. And if you're nervous or you're sitting on some inventory, if you have the capacity to send 2,000 more books and you have the books, send them in, right? Um, even if Amazon changes. So if you send in, uh, typically the restock limits adjust on Mondays, 
course, just like Amazon, it's kind of like throwing darts at a board. And every once in a while, I think we had a restock limit uh, uh, adjustment this morning. So they sometimes drip in twice a week, just depending on capacity at the warehouses. Um, in general, I talk to my warehouse manager every Monday and say, hey, where are we at? Let's look at our limits. Okay, if we've got room for 800, let's build an 800 unit pallet and let's get it out the door by Friday or at least book it by Thursday in case the limits change over the weekends. Uh, once it's scheduled, then Amazon will accept the inventory. You're good to go. And even if your limits drop, they're still going to like sell those those books. You just can't send in any more mm -hmm. until you sell through enough or until the limits change. So you have two options. One, be cautious and keep sending in fast moving inventory Two, shove in two more 2000 more books as fast as possible because you have the, the space. So yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Keep trying to ramp that up. And if you're sending the right inventory, then you should you should continue to see the blessings from the Amazon gods. Yeah. Avery, you might have a good answer to this question. Am I the only person who is having difficulty all of a sudden the last two months with getting reimbursed for lost inbound inventory? Um, I continue to hassle, but they're not budging anymore. I'm stuck sending what's M? Memphis. Memphis. Uh, 15 to 20 percent percent of the inventory is lost. So it's a significant problem with no reimbursement. First, I would take a step back and I would make sure that you're packing your box is good. After running restrictedinventory.com, I realized a lot of booksellers can't even pack a box. Caleb actually has a great video <laughs> on how to do that. This was kind of a joke. We recorded a video, just like camera over my shoulder and like, guys, here's how to package a box. And we got silly comments like, I can't believe I just watched that video, but uh, it's one of my better performing YouTube videos. And yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so make sure you're packing the box good because the carrier could lose the item before it even gets to Amazon. Yeah. Generally, if Amazon receives your item, uh, there's a much higher chance that they'll pay you for it. So if they admit that they received it, and especially if they admit that they lost it, which they will, if you go to if you go to unfulfillable inventory, there's a reason why. Uh, your inventory is unfulfillable. It's either because the customer damaged it, the carrier damaged it, or Amazon damaged it. And if they admit fault to that, you have a good chance of getting paid for it. There's a good article I read on Google. I just typed in how to get reimbursements from Amazon or how to get money back from Amazon. Just go look through a few of those articles. I gave it to my virtual assistant team and they were able to recover a lot of money uh, for items that Amazon lost. The way Amazon works is they lose your stuff, but they don't pay you for your stuff unless you ask them. So you have to make a case proving that they did indeed lose it. If you don't do that, they won't pay you for it. And if six months pass, I think it's six months, they will never pay you for it because it's too too old. Um, so I also use a service called Refunds Manager. Caleb told me about this and they charge 30% of whatever they get you back. And I think, we, uh, I was reading another article. I think it's roughly like every 30,000 in sales that you have, Amazon probably owes you between 300 and $1,000. So the way the service works is if they get you $1,000 back in reimbursements, they would charge your credit or debit card for 300 bucks for every thousand. So you're still profiting 700 off of that. It's a great service, but even using that service, I gave my VAs an article to go in and try and get reimbursed different ways. And they just followed all the steps and we squeezed out like an additional few hundred. So re uh, refunds manager probably just goes after the big fish. They probably go after the ones, you know, they know, you know, you're owed $500 for this set. We've gotten, I don't know how, how big of reimbursements you've got, Caleb, but I've gotten like one time it was a, it was a consignment book. It, it, uh, we got reimbursed like 1800 for it. So we, we uh, split that 50, we've 50 with seen, I think I shared this on a, an interview with Reezy. We've seen some crazy ones and I, I use the same thing. It's refunds manager. Um, there's a couple fly by night ones out there that do refunds and they kind of violate Amazon's terms. You have to, it, it can't be algorithmically done. It has to be like a human answering it. So make sure you, you, you do that. You do not want to be using a, an account that's violating Amazon's terms when they're asking for reimbursements. So just, just be careful, do your, your homework there. Refunds manager has been great. Um, what happens is when they lose a book, they're going to say like, you'll get your fair share of like eight cent reimbursements on a book that's selling for like 15 bucks prime. And you go, Hey, what, you know, what gives every once in a while you can go back and Amazon will give you that, you know, actually bump it up and say, look, it was going to sell for 15. My, my, my payout from you after your expense, your fees and FBA fees and Amazon fees and whatnot would have been like six bucks. And so a lot of times you can get that back. The question is what's your time worth and going in and, and doing that, you know, versus trying to go find more books. It's probably better spent finding more books. 
Uh, that's why a VA comes in handy. That's why these services come in handy. So your question, you know, I got, I get my fair share of eight cent reimbursements or sometimes the dreaded zero, like, Hey, it's not worth any money. Like, well, <laughs> it was when I sent it in, I promise. So you get, you get your handful of those. I had one where, um, I, I guess I, I probably, I think I sent it in at 50 bucks or 99 bucks or something. Right. So there's nobody on the listing. I think better world books came in on the listing as well. Uh, so shout out. We went and saw their headquarters about two years ago. Wanted to turn the page in Chicago. We stopped through. That was awesome. Uh, so they've got a great warehouse. I think at the time they had 11 million books in their Indiana warehouse. And that's a, uh, that is a lot of paper. And that was just listed books. They had truckloads of unprocessed. But what happened is Better World jumped on the on the listing. Amazon lost my book. And so now Better World is the only seller. And their repricer caused them to go up to like a thousand bucks or twelve hundred bucks or whatever their 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 price was when they're the only seller. When Amazon's algorithm came in and said, Hey, we lost Caleb's book, what's it worth? They looked at the current market pricing and said, Oh, it's worth twelve hundred bucks. And they reimbursed me twelve hundred minus Amazon's fees. And I think I got a payout of like 950 bucks. So every once in a while you get some wins. You know, I, I wasn't going to call Amazon and say, Hey, I think it's only a hundred dollar book. You probably <laughs> overpaid me because they, uh, you know, they get us on the other side quite a bit. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth a service like that. I don't want to go back in again, go back to the, if you had 800 books and had to maximize it and you had a month to do so, you could find a use for it. If you had to go in and scrape your Amazon account and salvage every last penny from, miss process books absolutely so I, I can't see who it is facebook user i know they've emailed in about it so i should remember but um if you're not getting reimbursed go back check your packaging dead space in boxes kills and so if you have empty space what's going to happen is a 50 pound box or 49.9 pound box is pretty heavy and so as somebody picks that up from ups or fedex and carries it wherever it's going, often they'll kind of get halfway to their destination and just kind of chuck it on the uh, conveyor or into their truck. Um, and so these boxes do get dropped around a bit and tumbled around uh, through the machinery and just through human error. And so the more dead space that's in it, the more they can bang into the sides of the cardboard box. And even a brand new cardboard box gets dinged up. The other thing is make sure you got thick enough boxes, make sure it's, it's rated for 50 pounds and make sure you use newer boxes. You know, if you got a box with $800 of books in it and you're skimping out and trying to reuse a box that's fairly beat up and thin, that's probably not the best use. Go spend a dollar on a box that's, you know, going to protect yeah. your $800. And it's hard to really understand that until you receive boxes. Like we're, we've, yeah. we're receiving so many boxes and like we, we will get empty boxes, boxes that have no books at all. And it's like, why did you even drop this off? Yeah. Or we'll get them just with the label. You know, yeah. but U USPS, especially, uh, we have libraries that ship us books and we used to use the post office because media mail is not zone based and it's roughly 50 cents a pound. It's gone up a bit, but we could ship a, tw a 50 pound box for $25. It didn't matter if it came from California or next door in Ohio, it was still 25 bucks. Um, and that seemed great. And the reason it was so cheap was because the risk of it not showing up was, yeah. was high. I think they yeah. lost one out of five boxes. That's why we started using FedEx instead so, fedex fedex handles your stuff much better than usps yeah dead space definitely kills i got three boxes this week and the guy that brought them in said don't lift them up the bottom's going to break out from underneath them and sure enough i lifted one of them up and all the books just drop out from it because there's dead space and it goes around and it ruins yeah. even a good box like you said so um we have a question from michael says why does scout iq my wife's phone go red my phone goes green on some books same database download so there's two possible reasons for that. If you both downloaded the database at the exact same time, first of all, make sure you're both actually going off the database or even better yet, go off live data. You can go into your settings and set it to live only on both phones, double check. But either you're using different triggers on each phone, one of them has one trigger set and the other one has another one, or one of your phones has um, uh, profit or a uh, buy price set, which is adjusting the triggers. Like one of them could be $0 buy price, the other one could be a dollar buy cost. Um, and that can also make one go green while the other one goes red. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Caleb. No, that's about it. Um, if you're seeing that screenshot, both of them, and send that into support at scoutiq.co, not com. Somebody has com and won't sell it to us for a reasonable price. So shame on you. You know who you are. That's me. Uh, I, I mean, I'll take it. I gave I, a super I would chat talk, today. I would, so. I would talk you into it. So support at scoutiq.co, or you can just message me on Facebook as well. Um, send some screenshots. We'll help look at it. There is a chance that one of you is dealing with some cached data. So one of you actually has old data. We can we can kind of sort that out quickly. 
Or like Matthew said, one of you has a buy cost or you have slightly different triggers or one of you bump the screen and touch a different price. So uh, we can definitely walk through that as well. So yeah, drop, a, drop us a line and we'll help troubleshoot because if you download it at the same time, you should have identical data. I, I would argue U-Haul boxes are better, Scott, just because you can have them, if you order at least 50, you get free shipping and you can have them delivered. And I think they're cheaper too. They're like 77 cents per box, which maybe is the same, but I'm all about, I think the, the, uh, the question you asked earlier is what's your time worth now? Like I hate, driving to Home Depot to get boxes. I hate knowing that my employees have to drive to Home Depot to get boxes. So I'd rather just have it delivered on my doorstep and order 50 boxes at a time. So here you go, Avery, here's another one for you. I wanted to ask you, do you still uh, believe a person can quit their job with a book business dealing with recycling? hundred percent. I think anybody that lives in the Northeast, speaking of the Pareto principle, Pareto, however you say that, 20% of the wealth of America is located from like Washington, D.C. up to Portland, Maine. And in that area, if you go to thrift stores, libraries, like anybody up there can make a living selling books. In the South, it's a little bit more difficult. But if you're near McKay's, you're, you're fine. Um, out West is pretty good too. Seattle, uh, any big city. Yeah. If, if you truly dedicate your time to it, like if you guys are working jobs eight hours a day, if you went out and sourced books eight hours a day and didn't even list them, you just dropped them off at a prep center and paid a dollar per book and you maximize your time sourcing books. You did that for three years and you knew the best places to get books. And you're not going to, you're probably going to be smart enough to eventually branch off into something different in terms of sourcing strategies like Caleb always talks about going upstream, you're probably going to find some type of weird way to go upstream. I found probably one of the weirdest ways to go upstream. I started restricted inventory.com. But if you do that for three years and you never even branch to those weird strategies, uh, I, I think it would be hard to not make six figures net profit. You know, that's just me. Also, can I share a quick story about yeah, yeah. how Amazon stole from me? Can you let me uh, share, share my screen? It looks yeah. like you're, uh, you're yeah, my thing's about to die anyway. as well. So your battery's yeah. running low. Yeah. Yeah. It's been doing that for a while. I don't know how to make that thing go away, but you're I'll probably, I'll probably disappear at some point, but you guys will be able to, to, uh, still hear me. Uh, can you put my screen on the yeah. screen? Okay. So this is a book that I found at a library years ago. I was actually with Caleb the first time I sold it whenever we were in Tennessee on that trip. Ah, uh, good old Tennessee. Yeah. I think that was late but that was that was 2019 that would have been so here it is, 2019 that was yeah. uh may around may 23rd right may 11th ish uh yeah it was early summer yeah so i sold it for two thousand dollars back then so we can zoom in here this is my sale when i'm with caleb had good luck around him it was like the only time it sold uh in this time frame and i sold it for two thousand dollars so even though the lowest price was 1200 <clears throat> i actually sold it for two thousand and it, it somehow triggered this guy's repricer. Now that I wasn't there anymore, he repriced up to 1500. Scroll out a little bit. I think that that bump or that drop actually looks like a, uh, a return. See how the rank went immediately back to where it was before? Okay. I think that's an aberration. So maybe it was uh, later in the summer. Scroll back out. Either either way, the story still stands. But Yeah, maybe it was here. Maybe it was there. Was it? Yep. No, that's January. Um, then we also had it one. It might have been summer of 18, to be honest. Okay. It could have been over there. Yeah, anyway. it definitely wasn't 2020. Um, so sometime that. in here is when I, when I sold it. Anyway, um, I bought that for 150 bucks. Ended up getting the, the set of books got wet because I, I had my canoe on top of my car. And uh, I never closed the straps on your door. Like they're flapping in the wind. And I closed the straps on the door. The three books got wet. I ordered the three books on eBay uh, to rebuild the set and ended up selling it for $2,000. So I ended up spending about 400 on that. And I, I sold it for 2000 still made a couple thousand, pro not a couple thousand, but at least a thousand profit. Then uh, a few years later, um, I was actually making a tutorial video. This is at, at the end of 2020. I made a tutorial video and uh, let's see. I was showing this book because I love looking at this keep graph. I think it's a great example. And I saw that, that it went down to like 500 bucks or 600 bucks. So this is me right here. I bought it. You can see this is where I purchased it. And then it, you, you actually see it went out of stock for a while. And then somebody hopped back on. No, this is this is where I bought it. I bought it like at 550. So I bought it dirt cheap. I was like, oh my gosh, someone's selling this. Had it delivered to my place in 
uh, I lived downtown Miami for a while, had it delivered there. And then like, I, for whatever reason, didn't send it in for a super long time. And then somehow my employee got it back in Nashville, Tennessee. I think I tried to send it to Amazon, but I did something wrong probably because I hadn't made a shipment in so long and it got delivered back at her house. So then she sent it back out and then Amazon pops on the listing randomly on warehouse deals. And my inventory is nowhere to be found on Amazon. Like it's just gone. And I, I had my VAs make all these cases and you can just see, they just tanked the price of this book and they ended up selling it, but this is a hundred percent mine. Like there's, there's no way this is not mine. There's only like three available or four available. You can see. And so some something happened to where they they got possession of my inventory and like did not know it was mine and and they they won't give it back to me like we we've opened so many different cases but uh, yeah Amazon sold it for it looks like about a thousand bucks <laughs> so that's awesome watch out for Amazon <laughs> that's um, awesome story they'll get you Caleb you all grab this one which data guessing the database download. So we are updating around the clock, but we actually shove it in uh, twice a day. So morning and evening. And uh, so if you you can download twice a day if you'd like and get slightly fresh data. The main goal is not to be accurate down to the penny. That's not you know, necessarily relevant. E-score kind of smooths over the rank uh, bounce, you know, bounces and, uh, and how much that is. Man, I can't think of any words right now. How often that uh, oscillates, there's the word. So eScore kind of helps pr protect you against that. And then, you know, a $12 merchant fulfilled book or a $20 prime book isn't going to change and all of a sudden tank tomorrow to, you know, six bucks. It might, one, one seller might jump on the listing, but in general, that's going to be a slow fade. Uh, I know some people think the race to the bottom is real and every once in a while people get super aggressive as they're getting out of the game and, and certainly dump inventory. But the database is primarily about speed. And if you're really nervous about it, once you kind of trigger, because again, when you're scanning books, it's more about how fast you can get through it. If you guys remember the old uh, uh, lawn mowing commercials, uh, I think it was a Super Bowl ad. It's uh, it's not how fast you mow, it's how how well you mow fast or something like that. And that's kind of the goal. You're trying to blaze through with good data. Um, I know that from personal experience, you can get up north of close to 800 to 1,000 books scanned in an hour if they're at a library sale. Yeah, and you're accepting. I got to the point where I was doing a thousand books. I would go to McKay's. Somebody asked a question about McKay's, but I would go in there and I would just make it a goal to scan a thousand books an hour. Yeah, and if you can get through a thousand books in an hour, again, you're going to find probably five ish percent in the field, anywhere from three to five percent accepts. So yeah. it's not a lot of accepts. So it's not about finding those five out of a hundred. It's about how quickly you can get through the ninety-five out of a hundred that are poor. And that's what the database is for. You can you can blaze through it faster because your time is worth money instead of doing a live lookup, which takes about a second for each each individual scan. So I don't mind. I probably update the database once a week when I'm out in the field. Uh, if I got a big sale or something, I'll update the night before just just to be sure. But yeah, we we push wholesale update updates twice a day to answer your question. So my strategy, Scott for for sourcing mckay's i actually moved right next to mckay's so i my, my goal was to go there every day to source that that's not what ended up happening but when i would go uh caleb put me on the book the one thing by gary keller is that his name gary keller yep gary keller with keller oh, williams really. yeah yeah so he said what's the one thing uh you know that's the most important in your business that can have the most impact um and, and at the time it was scanning books i was like i just want to scan more books so i would go in mckay's four hours a day i'd put headphones on and I would just scan as many books as possible. So my strategy, and this should be the strategy for library sales as well, and Second and Charles. Uh, Second and Charles sucks though, because you can't scan fast because they cover up the barcode with the sticker, which probably provides more opportunity because people don't want to deal with, you know, having to, to manually look up each book. So there's probably a much higher acceptance rate at Second and Charles. And Second and Charles, I don't think they accept textbooks. So they'll throw textbooks outside or something weird like that. Anyway, at McKay's, my strategy was I would just have one headphone open. I would just listen for when they're wheeling the cart out. Whenever the cart would come out, I would just go stand. And it was these booksellers that had been selling for like decades, literally. And they hated me because I would go in there with friends. I would hire people to work for me. And I was just going hard. I was scanning 1,000 an hour. They are probably scanning 100 an hour with their old PDA device. And I would just wait for the, for the books to be put on the shelf 
the the employees would yell at me because I would start scanning the books the moment they put it on the shelf. They'd be like, back up off me, dude. And this is like pre-COVID times. And so like the name of the game, though, is get the fresh inventory. And so I would just scan. Uh, I think I would scan like 5,000 books a day. And uh, I would, you know, I would scan the same books over and over again. I knew I was scanning the same books, but, you know, prices change. And uh, who knows if one new book was slipped in between the shelf. So that was my strategy there. Yeah, there's, there's no reason not to put the work in. Um, for those that live in small towns, like where I live right now, there's one thrift store in town and it's just a Goodwill and it doesn't have that great a selection. So you know, if you're not fortunate enough to live in a big city, when I was in Denver, I had, you know, a hundred thrift stores within, you know, 90 minute drive of my house in all directions. So that was, that was unbelievable. The, you know, there's lots of opportunity with lots of books. So if you're in smaller areas, you do got to get creative in terms of getting out and, and finding more books. Bolte, what would you recommend to do if the book cover is different, but the ISBN and title match? So in general, Amazon wants the ISBN to match. Sometimes, Typically, when a publisher rolls out a new design or a new edition, they will change the ISBN, but not always. Um, so in general, if the ISBN matches, you're going to be okay. Ultimately, it's a slightly higher risk of the customer returning it because they're going to say, I ordered the yellow edition and you sent me a blue book and I want yellow, even though the content's the same. So you do run the risk of... Uh, of frustrated customer that may return it. So if you're super risk adverse, maybe don't do it. In general, if the ISBN matches, we, we send it in. So we're okay. Yeah, just sell it under margin of safety. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thousand dollar book if you can find it. There are counterfeits of that one as well, because anytime there's money to be made, there's shams and counterfeits. So uh, can we sell books from Bin Drop? Is that a company? Yeah, I'm not familiar with. Bin I know Drop. of. Uh, you know book, I know of Book Drop. That sounds like that's that's Rob's new company, Bin yeah. Drop. <laughs> bin Drop. The book, the book Bin Drop. Um, I don't know what that means. Can you sell books from donation bins? Sure. Can you sell books that have been dropped? Sure. Uh, maybe clarify what Bin Drop. Well, is only so there. long as you're the one that owns the donation bin. Let's make that. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't shouldn't be fishing through somebody else's. Um, we'll take. Uh, we've been going for 90 minutes. We'll take one or two more questions. And again, I do have two of the uh, the limited edition. You know, we only did one print run, so we should probably do an NFT of these for real. We have one large and one small. I think somebody earlier claimed a small, so if we can track down you, we'll we'll do that. I have one more large to give away. It's a very very soft shirt. And uh, for those that don't know, Rockville, Maryland was where uh, a law firm was doing test buys, and so just to have some fun, we made these nice shirts and we I wear met them around. I a girl who worked for Pearson. Yeah, I forgot exactly what she did, but I remember having some strong emotions when I met her. I had some <laughs> stuff to tell her. <laughs> uh, and not strong emotions like, wow, she's beautiful. Strong emotions. She was of, beautiful, but I was, I was angry. Yeah, more so Pearson has been a thorn in our side, but yes. <laughs> but she was she was just working more. She said that they're putting uh, a lot of effort into to, uh, building their ebook side of their business. And I said, yeah, I know they are. <laughs> Well, there's uh, some of the textbook companies, again, they don't make money when we resell a book that's used on Amazon. They get no money off of it. So in a perfect world, they would only sell new books. They would disallow or make it. They should make all their textbooks tied to an NFT. And then that way, when we resell the, the book, they <laughs> we can buy it with books. Ethereum too. Um, so yeah, textbook publishers don't want used books to get sold. But once you buy something, you have the right to resell it. So what they try and do is add digital content where you have to buy you know, a $10 book and a $100 code. Um, they've tried many different things. Ebooks are one way to do it. Some companies are doing rentals only. So you might see that a little bit more in general. Like, uh, I think the future of textbooks will continue to go down. You're just going to see way more creativity related to, um, digital versions. One that's thing okay, about but... that is, have you guys watched, uh, the Netflix, uh, show, what is it? The, uh, the college scandal or something like that? Nope, I haven't seen it. The college so. scandal is about how this, I think he was like a college counselor and he had connection. No, he's a high school counselor. He had connections with all the uh, prestigious colleges and he would help get kids into college by, by making them look like they're a part of the, the rowing team or like some weird sport. And he would, he would pay the coaches off. He would pay the different departments off and he would get kids in for like 200 to half a million to millions of dollars, the, the parents would have to donate to the college. So they donate millions of dollars and then they would get the kid in because, oh, they're like a special athlete. And it was usually some weird type of sport. And then eventually he got caught by the FBI and they uh, 
they tapped, he agreed and they tapped all the phone calls with the parents and he got all the parents in trouble for doing this. So the college counselor, this was his way of, of not getting uh, that much jail time. He, he got all the parents that he originally convinced to give the money or donate the money to the schools. Anyway, what I took away from that movie was, wow, people really, really do value college and, and it like outrageously, like they value, especially like the prestigious schools, but yeah, the name you, you can even ones. argue like, community college like everybody wants their kid to go to college and when they're paying ten thousand a year fifteen thousand or a semester ten thousand a semester or at these schools you know thirty fifty hundred thousand a semester what does it cost or you know proportional to the books they're paying for who cares they pay fifteen hundred dollars in, in textbooks and so that made that maybe changed my opinion on like i always thought that like, textbooks would be gone in the next few years maybe they'll they'll be successful at making, you know, the eBooks a thing. I think uh, college bookstores have a lot to, to profit off of that. So I think that that's maybe where the resistance is and why it's not going to eBooks so quickly. But I think as far as demand goes for textbooks, it's not going anywhere. I think college in general, it will dwindle out eventually, but I think it's going to be much slower than we thought. We're seeing a lot of like Gary V and some big names coming out and saying that college isn't necessary. And I, I, I agree with that. I think apprenticeships are much more valuable in, in real life experience. That said, the college degree is kind of that that golden ticket that at least gets you in the door for an interview. So yeah. like it or not, it, it's here. You actually made, raised a really good point in terms of, um, you know, if you're paying 20K a year, 30, 40, 50K a year for college, 1500 books on textbooks isn't much. There's a really good business principle there, and that is hang around and try and find ways to serve really big businesses. If you are trying to hyper optimize a business that's only doing 20 grand a year in revenue, like a small part time book flipper, uh, 20 grand in sales, you can try and optimize and find ways to pinch pennies. But you're, you're only going to save so much money versus if you find a company doing a million dollars in sales or 10 million dollars in sales, some uh, some small fine tuned way that you can help them optimize might actually be worth a hundred grand. Yeah. So a way to help a big company with something that's not worth their time. That's what refunds manager does. It's not worth my time to go figure out which books were lost and, and ask for reimbursements. They're able to do that at scale through software, but they can also help, you know, they're helping me, they're helping Avery, they're helping smaller sellers and they're helping massive sellers. And because they're able to do that, they can capture that value. So something that's material is the accounting term, something that's material for a $20,000 a year seller, might be 200 bucks. 200 bucks is very meaningful. That's 1% of their sales versus a $20 million seller. 200 bucks is nothing to them. And it's not even worth trying to go and save that 200 bucks one time, only if it's repeatable. Yeah. So find, find a big business, find something bigger. There you go. hundred million dollar offer. What's Have that? you read this one, Caleb? Uh -uh. That's the one I was recommending you, Caleb, the Alex Hormozzi one. It's oh, a really yeah. good book. He, he talks about make sure you're in the right market. So, you know, you could be, you could be a really good entrepreneur, but in the wrong market where, you know, there's not players with money, they're not going to pay you anything and you're going to be much worse off than somebody who's not a great entrepreneur, but they're taking action in a, in a great market. So, yep. yeah, yeah. That's a great YouTube channel too. Alex Hermosi. If any of you guys want to search that on YouTube, he puts out content like a few times a week now and it's the best content I've seen on YouTube for a long time. So yeah. definitely check him out. Cool. Well, with uh, that, we will apprenticeships plus self-learning versus online platforms like Udemy. Yeah, that's where things seem to be going, don't they? Yeah. Well, with that, we'll wind things down before uh, Avery's camera quits on him. So, Avery, <laughs> thanks for coming today and for sponsoring it. We talked you into that as well. Um, <laughs> Peer pressure, uh, man. Dinner's on me next time we Ex hang out. But... Exposed me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your time. I know that that is actually the most yeah. valuable resource any of us have. So. Um, good to see you. Let's hang out again real soon. Matthew, thanks for putting this together. And for those of you that were here and watch, and especially those that donated, thank you very much. We appreciate all of you. I do have two shirts to give away. We'll clean those up as well. And uh, a little tip that I opened with at Avery's conference, but you are the same person you are today, five years from now, except for two things. Do you remember what those are, Avery? The books you read. Uh -huh, that was one one. Thing. And then the friends you have. Yeah, the people you meet. So, yeah. um, you know, if you just go out and do the same thing tomorrow, you're not going to improve. You're not going to grow. You're not going to learn. So get out there, learn content. There's so much free content out there in terms of YouTube and everything else. So get out there, read some books, watch some YouTube channels, uh, try and learn, expose yourself to new ideas and get out there. And, and if you're an introvert, go out and meet some people. And uh, I promise that will help you grow. So that's it. Yeah. 
Thanks, everybody. And uh, we will catch you again real soon. Yeah, thanks for joining.